Should Siri celebrate abortion? Welcome to Answers News for March 28, 2022. I'm Roger Patterson, joined, joined today by Patricia and Dr. Gabriella Haynes. We're going to be looking at that question about a city near Washington, D.C. in just a minute after we talk about can cousins be twins? That's an intriguing question we're going to look at here. So here we have a story that comes to us in a very interesting fashion. So there's a city in Ohio called Twinsburg. And as you might imagine, this city has a festival for twins. So every year, these twins arrive and they have lots of festivities there for twins, identical twins and other sorts. But these twins met, you can see the couples here, and this twin set of brothers and twin set of sisters met, started dating, and they got married shortly after. And now the interesting twist is they have sons. And those sons, genetically speaking, are actually brothers, even though they're cousins. That's kind of weird. Super cool, though. And what's really funny, kind of, is that they all live in the same house right now. So, like, can you imagine for the kids growing up with, like, multiples of both parents? That'd be interesting. Is that mom? Is that aunt? <laughs> Dad? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, cousin. Oh, no. Brother? I don't know what you are. Yeah. It'll be a close-knit family, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, gets, it gets all very confusing. But if we think about this, uh, this, this arrangement is called quaternary multiples. And genetically speaking, you're very closely related, though uh, the relationship would be cousins. The way that you are paired together would be much like that you're brothers, genetically speaking, and the combination of genes would be almost like your twins, but you're not mm -hmm. <laughs> because you had different mothers and different fathers, even though they are genetically identical as, as we can get in, in this world. But a very interesting situation that arises there. I, I'm not twin with my sister, but I was telling them that my son, the youngest one, he does not look nothing like me. Neither he's dead, just like my sister. So sometimes when I talk about him, uh, my friend says like, oh, your nephew? And I was like, no, that's my son. <laughs> but they, yeah, they like uh, joking with me about that. The genetics, it's just beautiful the way that things can be arranged. Now, our first, our first kids were twins as well, and it was a boy and a girl. But you would be totally surprised how many people they'd ask, oh, is it a boy and a girl? And the next question, are they identical? <laughs> and I... I had to restrain myself oh. from slapping them, but you just want <laughs> No, they're not identical. It's a boy and a girl. Come on, really. All right, to our lead story, Alexandria was asked to honor abortion providers. Then Catholics and conservatives spoke up. So coming to us from Alexandria, Virginia, right outside of the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., the mayor was asked to provide a special day of recognition and this was brought to them by Whole Woman's Health, one of the abortion providers there in the area. And the goal was to set aside uh, March 10th as a day of special proclamation to promote abortion providers as Abortion Provider Appreciation Day. And with, with this coming to the attention of people in the community, the mayor got a significant amount of backlash from the community and others, as you can suppose. Absolutely. You got to, you know, kind of wonder about that wording, hey, like abortion provider. It's like this is a healthcare service and it's a right for women to access. And that's how they have to frame these things, because when you're not operating on the side of truth and facts and logic, all you have to work with is rhetoric. So that's why we see all these like euphemisms being used in the debate. And changing the definition and the terms, that's one strategy that has been used in everywhere. Because once that you change the term and the definition, uh, other people won't get that information in a, in a wrong way. They're just going to understand as a provision, something that is good, something they're, to, they're trying to do for the good of others, which is not the case at all. Yeah, so Mayor Justin Wilson, who's a Democrat, said it was more controversial than a proclamation should be. We appreciate those providers for doing the work that they do and doing it under adverse conditions at times, but ultimately it didn't need to be on the council docket and facing that backlash they wound up canceling this and there was quite a bit of pushback from within the community lots of hundreds of people calling in and and contacting the council members and dealing with this and this comes in the face of uh, our country dealing with the 
abortion issue very, uh, very much in light of the Dobbs v. Jackson decision that we're expecting to be handed down from the Supreme Court here at the end of this present term, probably in June and other cases that are being dealt with and, and other laws that are on the books that we're gonna be talking about here in just a minute. But this was uh, prompted by complaints from the Catholic Diocese of Arlington and Molly Hemingway, who's a popular writer, uh, uh, Lutheran writer, and other people in the community who recognize the problem with this. Now, sadly, this date is on March 10th because there was a uh, abortionist, David Gunn, who was killed on this day, uh, murdered outside of his clinic in 1993. Not something we would condone, but that's the sad fact of what happens inside of an abortion clinic every day, that it's the murder of innocent babies happening. And that's why we should be speaking up against these things. Absolutely. I thought it was interesting that the last sentence that this uh, re um, reporter chose to highlight was... Um, that it's a shame that a very vocal minority has taken this course of disruptive and disrespectful action, talking about people who are against abortion. Um, I mean, even if that was true, the number of people who believe something is irrelevant to whether it's true. But just um, what, as you're reading articles, one way that you can identify reporter slanting or bias is by looking at what they choose to highlight in that last sentence of the article, because that's what the author wants to leave you with. And in this case, it is a very anti-life message. Mm -hmm. So something to watch out for. And related to that, our next two articles, Wyoming legislature passes bill to ban abortions if Roe v. Wade is reversed, and Idaho legislature approves bill banning abortion after six weeks, modeling its legislation on restrictive Texas law. So remember SB 8 from Texas that uh, basically allows private citizens to be able to sue those involved in an abortion after there's uh, heartbeat activity or cardiac activity present inside of uh, the child. Uh, we'll try to avoid the word fetus because that's one of those desensitizing words that you'll see in these types of articles, especially uh, the Washington Post article that we uh, just looked at and the one here with, about the Idaho legislature. They use that term to try and dehumanize that child that's inside of the womb and that language that's used by the writers is one of those things we need to be very aware of. So these laws that are being passed are being referred to as trigger laws because if, in the case of the, the Dobbs case that's before the court, if that re, uh, effectively repeals Roe v. Wade, then there need to be laws in place that would deal with abortion. The Democratic states are trying to put in pro-abortion laws and the Republican states are basically trying to put in anti-abortion laws in place and that's what we see here. It's sad that they're the, these battle weights over life. One trying to murder kids, children, and the other one trying to save them. So it's just so sad that unfortunately today uh, the world's battling over something that it shouldn't even be thought about. You have to protect life. It doesn't matter how many weeks, how many days, how many hours. The definition of life is not made by how many weeks or how many hours how many days they have but by god and it's it's right there in the bible so we cannot just be um we need to be speaking out about this point because it's very important if life is not important what else is it what else is going to be nothing nothing it's more important than life absolutely and god's word does give us that foundation for defending life Preborn life, born life, all human life is valuable because we're made in the image of God. But again, if you're not standing on the side of truth and life with God, all you have to work with is rhetoric and propaganda. And a type of that we see here um, in this debate is, for instance, framing effects. So that's where stating the same information in different ways can make people draw different conclusions from it. So for instance, you'll see in articles like this that are pro-abortion, people will be framing things as um, women's health rights, as opposed to protecting the life of a child. So that's another thing to watch out for. And again, like we saw in that last article, um, the end sentence of the article about the, the Idaho bill was saying that, oh, well, this bill creates an incredible cascade of risks for people who get abortions. So again, you're seeing rhetoric being used to frame it in a certain way, and that's what the author wants to leave you with. Not the risk to the child <coughs> in the womb that's right. that faces the ultimate risk of losing their life. Yeah, we need to understand that every paper that we read, everything we see, they're not 
neutral. They have a worldview, they have ideas, they are applying that in the way that they write and that they think. So every time that we see something, we have to have that in back of our mind that they have a worldview. Mm -hmm. And point? so because the Supreme Court has upheld uh, the, the um, efficacy of the Texas law, several states are looking at uh, modeling their legislation after that, and we see that happening I think we have at least 12 states now who have these laws in effect that will um, basically block abortions to a certain point. But you'll see a lot of headlines, especially from uh, the pro-life movement, that say this effectively blocks abortions in these states. Well, if we're going to be honest, it doesn't, because the one thing it really doesn't block is the use of abortifacient medications, which can be used at all times during this process, and they don't count those costs in these things. So we need to be mindful of that and be praying that um, we could see the gospel brought into these conversations and changing hearts and minds on these That's issues, right. not just the political uh, aspects of these. All right, our next article takes us to some DNA modifications. New DNA modification system discovered in animals. It's almost unbelievable, this study author says. So here we have some little critters. Uh, that's, that's my favorite word to talk about all kinds of animals. Little critters that we'd find in pond water. Uh, I do a science show called Unlocking Science, and uh, we do live shows at the Creation Museum, and we pull a drop of pond water and look at it under the microscope. We find these little creatures called rotifers all the time. They've got these little um, cilia structures on their mouth, and they, they look like little wheels are turning to draw food into their mouth, so they're called rotifers. Roto, you hear that in there. And inside of the rotifer's genome, they found this section that they believe they co-opted from bacteria over 60 million years ago. Now, this is all based on uh, genetic studies and evolutionary assumptions that go into these things. But these rotifers are uh, very animal-like creatures, even though they're very small. So they're animals. We think of them as animals. And so the title of this is a little bit misleading. It's not a As monkey always. or a dog or something like As that. Okay. These are microscopic little, little critters. And this gene sequence uh, is a regulatory process, and it, it stops genes from jumping all over the place in these, in these little critters. And it's a very fascinating process. But as we've already talked about, what are some of the assumptions that they're looking at going into this here? Yes, well, I mean, that, that's an important thing to watch for is when you're reading an article, ask what are the things that we can actually observe and see right now? And then, like we've been talking about, what are the assumptions behind that? So in this case, we're looking at these little rotifers. They're super cute. And we can look at I their genes. So. <laughs> they're kind of cute. <laughs> I mean, they'd make good pets. They're low maintenance. Anyway, so we can look at the genes in them and see that that gene that regulates um, this epigenetic marker or a regulatory, regulatory sequence, mm -hmm. there we go, um, it has some similarities with the gene we see in bacteria. That's all the facts we have to work with now. So what are the assumptions there from an evolutionary perspective? Well, that gene must have come from the bacteria. It must have picked it up somehow. We can see some horizontal transfer of genes in some creatures. But in this case, the researchers are saying it's almost unbelievable. Like, how could this have happened? It doesn't make sense because this is a really complex um, enzyme and like regulator. So they're like, how did this happen? But from a biblical perspective, it makes a lot of sense. That is probably a really good design feature. The other assumption is the age. Yes. Right? Again, 60 million years ago, who was there? Nobody was there to absorb that. So this is all interpretation. That's all the worldview putting um, um, these ideas to tell the whole story of evolution. That's right. Mm -hmm. So let's watch out for those things as we're reading these articles and not just jump onto the bandwagon with them. Speaking of that, Family Tree of Extinct Apes reveals our early evolutionary history. And so here we're supposed to assume that we're connected to the apes in some way. We've evolved from some type of ape-like ancestor. And this is a type of cladistic study. So what this researcher has done is she has examined uh, 274 different characteristics by looking at the bones, basically the skulls and other measurements and features that you can take by examining these different ape-like creatures uh, that she has access to and 
plugging these into complex computer algorithms and assigning the values and then letting this process run out. And it constructs this little branching tree diagram that tells you how closely related these things are. And the further away those branches are, the further back in evolutionary history they branched off from one another. And that's how close of a cousin you are. Your first cousins or second cousins or 81st cousins. Yeah, I, I, I spoke at the museum yesterday and I was talking about um, ocelope, uh, ocelope scenes. And then I said, well, when you go to the museum, you see this, like those creatures that look like human, but with a lot of ape characteristic. Sometimes you say, it's like your kid, you say like, hey mom, this is our family. Like, no, that's not my family, that's your dad's family. You know, and I was just joking around with those things. And because they put this idea as true as it's totally true when you go and check the data so why 274 uh, characteristics why not less why not more that just shows that you pick and choose whatever character you want when you're doing cladistics you check the first of all the data is all not available so some of the data it's available some it's not the data can be mislead can be misleading you also, the data can be misinterpreted. The, the data can be faulty because we have seen so many times something has been identified as something and then they find out that it's something else and the Nebraska man was the case. They found one tooth uh, and then from that tooth they just drew the person, the other person, where they live and then it was actually a tooth of a pig. So that's what we see. And that's unfortunately what they do. They just use this data, this information, that's all pick and choose, and they throw in a, in a soft truth that gives you a lot of branches, a lot of trees, and then you go and pick the tree that you think that it's more um, reasonable. So again, the definition of terms here, the remaining apes are all class, classed as hominids. So here they're just um, lumping everything together, you know, man and apes, all everything together because they want to change the terms that they want us to see things in a different way. This is the worldview being applied. And um, one thing that I thought it was very interesting here, uh, the, 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 the researcher says, she expect pushback on that, but she says, I'm quite confident in it, in the street of life industry and the, that, they, that she, they are <clears throat> publishing. And she said, I'm quite confident in it. The word confident means confide in Latin, which means with faith. She has faith that's what she is doing is the correct. So that's just a belief. It has no data to be grounded, nothing like that. But unfortunately, it has been written like that. Yeah, that's really interesting and in how, like you say, there's all these assumptions that go into these evolutionary family trees, but then it's presented as fact in museums and textbooks. So yeah, it's just important to recognize as these trees are being built, <laughs> even the idea, like to even have an evolutionary tree in the first place, you have to be assuming that evolution can happen and does happen and did happen. And then assuming that similarities show relatedness and then assuming like, okay, so we're gonna look at these similarities, what similarities you pick, that can actually change what tree you end up with. So all those assumptions that go into it. So yes, just recognizing where these trees come from, not taking <coughs> them necessarily as fact. There's even an interesting little like just either or fallacy in this article. So that's where you're given two options to pick from as truth, when there could be other options. So in this case, she was saying that this tree shows um, it still leaves a question, did the last common ancestor we share with living apes live in Africa or Eurasia? or maybe it was neither, and we don't share an ancestor with living apes. Maybe so, mm -hmm. we have a common ancestor in Adam and God created us. Yep. Maybe there's another option. Yeah, there. that's what the Bible says, yeah. correct. All right, moving on. Don't say gay bill passes in Florida and goes to the governor. So this is a, um, again, the slant that we see here, this uh, quote, don't say gay bill. This is not the actual language of the bill. But this is the way the bill has been characterized by people who are against it. The actual language of the bill reads quite differently. It says, classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. So you'll notice the word gay is not used anywhere in there, but people are pushing back against this from the LGBTQ community saying that they won't allow the indoctrination of 
students in kindergarten through third grade or at age appropriate levels in other grades uh, to be taught these things. And here we have a very real um, fight going on within the school system of who's controlling the education. And that's the, re the really important point, right? Because whoever can influence the kids influences the future. So that's why this is such a huge issue is they really want to make sure that they have access to the kids while they're young. And again, all the redefinition of wording that goes along with that, that we've talked about so much, that goes back to how people who don't start with God's word as their authority, if you want to control reality yourself and make yourself God and control truth, part of that goes with controlling the language. So for instance, it talks about how the president of the US called the bill hateful. So we're seeing a shifting definition of the word hate here, such that hating something now means not wanting to teach it to kindergartners. But there's no other subject in the world that we use that definition of hate for. Right. It wouldn't make sense. And also using the, the, the idea that the president said that. So it's the authority. So now you all have to, to bow You've to, to, to that. You've got to follow in To follow in line to what he mm -hmm. thinks. And that's not the point. Again, it's a, it's a logical fallacy right there trying to use the authority of someone to bring up the idea that what you're doing is right or what you, it's wrong. You know, so that's that's a big problem here. And the, the bill has nothing to do with what they're presenting here. Mm -hmm. So it's really a reaction to what uh, we would say is the over-sexualization of the content mm -hmm. of many curricula. And they're rightly reacting against those things. And it's the parents' responsibility to be teaching those things to their children as, as God has designed. All right, our next uh, story takes us to Disney Plus, one of the uh, streaming services you can access. Disney Plus drops trailer for first Muslim superhero in Ms. Marvel. So you can go and uh, watch this trailer. And what we see here is an interaction of the culture in a pluralistic way. So if we think about America, we, we think of America as the great melting pot of ideas. And uh, there are different views of that, but the intention probably was people would come to America and the cultures would blend together. And in the, the Marvel universe, and I'll probably get myself in trouble because I really don't follow all this stuff. There's like Marvel and DC and they're like rivals or something. I don't even know. They're superheroes. <laughs> Not my, they do some superhero stuff. There's, I'll probably get, I'll mix them all up and like, Mar, uh, like Spider-Man and Batman or in the same thing or something or they're I don't even know where they all fit together so this uh, trailer that's come out is very interesting because it takes a bit of blending of cultures and in our pluralistic society it brings in the first Muslim superhero and not just that but a female Muslim yeah, that's right. And one thing for thinking about media discernment, because this is kind of where we're getting to here, is like, okay, so as Christians, like, then not that there's, like, it's great to learn about other cultures and all that kind of thing, but just something to keep in mind when you're watching movies is recognizing that even if you're thinking critically about what's going on, when you hear a message, you cannot unhear it. So some people say, well, with media, you can just eat the meat and spit out the bones. That works for a buffet. <laughs> but when you're listening to something or watching something, yep. you have ingested it. Um, and once a lie is like in your mind, you can't necessarily n like get it out in a sense. So that's why, say, repeated messages are really common propaganda technique. Uh, studies have found that students who hear a message repeatedly, even if they know it's false, will begin to answer questions as though they think it's true. That's called the illusionary truth effect. So just recognize when you're watching the media, you're being exposed to repeated messages from a secular worldview that is going to have an impact on your mind. Use biblical discernment as you're watching it and as you're choosing what you're watching. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so if you're interested in streaming options, we have a great resource, Answers TV, and you can find more information about that on our, our website and get great programming. We offer all kinds of great things. I mentioned the Unlocking Science program that I get to do. We've got great nature programs like Hike and Seek and Shoes Off. Uh, all of our conferences get promoted there. Our Answers News program that we're doing now, lots of great content. All of our speakers' content goes up on there. So great resources for the family, um, other things that are on there that are available to rent and purchase as well, connected with other ministries. So great resources if you're not interested in buying into those other cultural ideas. Our final article for today says, Endless Forms Most Beautiful, Why Evolution Favors Symmetry. And if we think about the, the 
beautiful things that we see in nature, evolutionists would ask, why do we see such beauty if all of these things are just the product of random blind forces interacting over time? They can't deny that they're there. They obviously see all of these beautiful things and they appreciate those things. So why are they there? Now, as a Christian, I would say they're recognizing those things because they're made in the image of God and they're programmed to see God in the world. They're seeing those things because God has created those beautiful things. But this is a bit of a conundrum for the evolutionists. That's right. So they have to try to think of an evolutionary explanation that can explain this apparent design. So in this case, they're saying, well, um, maybe symmetry is kind of simple to arrive at. So evolution would just tend to make symmetrical things because it's, it's straightforward, right? He here says evolution has an overwhelming preference for simple algorithms. And it's funny because evolution now has a mind and yeah. a mind that it's got a math which is way better. So now, evolution prefer, just a concept. I prefer bacon. So evolution is like me because it prefers certain things. Yeah. Okay. You know? All right. So that's, that's a fallacy. And that's it's just, when you read papers it's important for us to understand about logical fallacies because you can see them and evolution is just a concept. Evolution is not a, a entity where it can prefer something um, over something else. So it's it's a it's a problematic a paper right here, just trying to tell the story of evolution, but not having much to tell about because the beauty, it's because it was created by God. Totally. And even, I mean, there's so much more design besides just symmetry. And also, by the way, just because something is symmetrical, that doesn't mean it's simple. <laughs> there's some really right. complex symmetry in the world too. Right. Um, and the point is, like they're saying, one of the analogies they used is like, oh, this can get around that whole monkeys on a keyboard thing. So if you have enough monkeys typing randomly, they'll eventually arrive at something that makes sense, right? And it's the same thing that happened with DNA. So they're saying, well, so monkeys would overwhelmingly be more likely to produce simple recipes than no recipe at all. Time out. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the monkeys come from in the first place? And right. the typewriters the and the information, the information and all system? that. So mm -hmm. they're begging the question. They yes. are. And even if you could get like a simple... I mean, you can't really get a simple recipe, but even getting, that's the thing, like a monkey would likely produce no recipe at all, more overwhelmingly, same thing with like mm -hmm. trying to get a functional protein. And that's also missing out on all the other apparent design that we can recognize from creation. For instance, um, there's a, a mathematical ratio, a ratio called the golden ratio that we see in a lot of human made designs. And just like it's a beautiful design feature that you see mm -hmm. all over nature. How does evolution explain that? We have a great article about that on answersingenesis.org. I'd encourage you to check it out as well. Yeah, but apparently evolution favors things. It prefers <laughs> things, it discovers things, it searches over things. Mm -hmm. All of these things are true. They about do a evolution. lot of things. And they conclude all that that you just said based on what? Using computer to model and to explore evolution's preference. So that's the point. You build a software with your idea, your assumptions, everything you want it to be, and then you run things that you want. Um, so the result is just, it's just what you want it to be. Unfortunately, that's what they're trying to do, and <coughs> that's a problem with a lot of research that we have, we have seen. Yeah. Well, that's our last article, but you guys know we love to promote resources because we want to get resources in your hands that are going to allow you to think biblically about these things. A couple of things we want to feature today. We've got these books, Volume 1 and Volume 2, of How Do We Know the Bible is True? Uh, these are multi-volume books. Um, I've got some chapters in here uh, dealing with different things. I think you've got, uh, you might, not in these, but no, some other not. things. Um, Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge and Dr. Purdom, others have articles in here dealing with different things. So the, the idea of theistic evolution and how can we trust the Bible's um, authority and veracity, different topics like that covered in books like this, great resources for you to get a hold of and deal with things like that. Uh, coming up this next weekend, uh, starting next week, we have our women's conference, Answers for Women Rooted, Standing Firm in a Twisted World. Uh, that'll be here live streamed. Options are available for you if you can't be here on site. Uh, you can look into that. Look at AnswersForWomen.org to find out more details about that. I'll be speaking, and uh, you'll be speaking, Patricia, right? No, I'll be speaking. You'll be speaking, be speaking but no. you're not. Uh, Dr. Georgia Purdom. We've got Daryl Harrison from the Just Thinking podcast. Laura Story here doing music. Lots of things. So that'll be uh, later this week actually coming up. 
And um, then coming up later this fall in October, we've got our answers for pastors and Christian leaders, a culture in crisis. So we're going to be uh, featuring some great speakers there dealing with those types of issues. And um, maybe you'll be back from Canada. I hope oh, so, yes. Yeah. 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 We hope my, so. my last episode of Answers News for now because, yeah, i got to go back to Canada for a little bit. But. All right. So thank you all for joining us today. God bless, and we'll see you next time on Answers News.